Um, I am so excited you clicked on this episode. I am bringing you some awesome information that will help you feel more free and light in your life. Today, I have Jennifer Berger on the show. She is a traveler, a minimalist, and a dream chaser. She grew up near Baltimore and now lives in Australia. Sound familiar? What fun. It was super fun to connect with her. She's traveled from London to China to New Zealand to Central America. <laughs> and she's on the show today to help us with clutter and organizing. And speaking of how she went from a shopaholic to her current minimalist lifestyle. She dropped a lot of really helpful tips in this episode that helped me and I know they'll help you. So thanks for listening in. And then after the show, please head over to some of the links that I share in the show notes to let Jennifer, you appreciate her time and you now are taking some steps to feel lighter in your life too. Let's go warriors. All righty, warriors. I have a treat for you. I have Jennifer Berger on the show today. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I am so glad to have you. And I know my warrior listeners are going to be so glad to listen in. I wanted to quickly read a um, blurb that you had from your website, speaking about what you're doing, because I think it will speak to my listeners and, and sh listen to this warrior. She's a great, this is a great interview to listen to if you feel like your home is overflowing and you feel like you're drowning in stuff or you're always busy and there's never enough time to do the things that matter most, or there's always a countdown to the weekend or your next holiday, you often feel trapped or you feel like you're going through the motions and not truly living your life. Well, I've got Jennifer on the show today, which is so exciting. And I'm so excited that you're here to help all of us because I'm quite sure listeners could really relate to at least one of those sayings. And um, I just would love for you to help us bring some ease to our life. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. I'm happy to be here and, and to chat about it. Which is great. So you say that you're so, um, so the work that I do. Oh, yeah. You say that you're a reformed shopaholic turned minimalist, and that you believe that clearing out the clutter is a vital part of creating the life you love. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, sure. So I was a full on shopaholic from pretty early on. Um, so I live in Australia now, like you, but I grew up in America. Um, I had, you know, my first job at like 15, my family owned a restaurant. So I was earning money quite young um, and spending it quite young. So, you know, by, by as young as 20 years old, I was I can see now that I had a problem. I thought mm -hmm. it was normal back then. I thought that that was just, you know, what, you know, teenage or, you know, young women did, but I can see now that it was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it only escalated all throughout my twenties. I got to the stage where I was shopping five, six, seven times a week, mm -hmm. had a walk-in closet that was a whole guest bedroom. Um, and really it felt like shopping was my outlet for everything all the stress in my life whenever I, and I had a lot of things that I was dealing with that I just wasn't able to cope with. So I use shopping as an outlet, but mm. as I think a lot of people sometimes experience, you just keep buying these things. You feel like you have nothing to wear. You're not actually any happier, but you just keep thinking the next thing you're going to buy mm. is going to sort of make things better. Um, and so that was sort of my experience for 15, you know, close to 20 years. And then I discovered, um, you know, discovered for myself, I should say, reading these articles about minimalism and decluttering. And it seems so silly to say now, but at the time I was just shocked. It had never occurred to me that I could just intentionally buy less and own less. Um, but the more that I read these stories, it just really inspired me to dive in. And mm. that was sort of the start of a 10 year sort of experience of simplifying my life. That's so neat. It is sort of like that with like different things in our lives, how like we just start like looking at something differently and it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have to go shopping every day. You know, we sort of get in the habit of shopping or the habit of, of using shopping to, to deal with, as you said, like whatever feelings you're having in your life. Um, and then when we start, it just, we, it's like bringing awareness to what we're doing. It sometimes feels like a big, you know, light bulb has gone on in our life. Um, so I love that. I would like, can you speak a little about how 
because I, I love your work on, on noticing that sort of this external clutter creates internal clutter, like in our brain, like why, why might someone want to look at their clutter or their spending habits or their, um, the stuff that they have in a, in a different way? How might it help them? Oh, I'm <clears throat> sorry. Absolutely. There's several reasons. Um, some of them are a little bit more obvious. And then some of them you sort of notice as you start doing the work. The first one, which is, you know, the most abundantly obvious is that the things in your home that you're not using, they kind of represent unfinished decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got some yarn, you started knitting a sweater four years ago, mm -hmm. and now you haven't made the decision, am I going to finish that sweater? Am I not going to finish? And if you don't realize, you might not realize it because it's just one item, but the combination of that, everything around your home, you know, you've got some platter in your kitchen that you haven't used. Mm -hmm. Am I going to throw a dinner party? Should I have done that? Should I add that to my list this summer? And every one of these items, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, is like an unspoken to-do list. Mm -hmm. And the weight of it, even if it's tidy, even if your home looks outwardly, you know, clean and appealing, it's just that pressure. And I'm sure you're aware there's the mental load that so many women are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And every one of those items is like another brick sort of stacking on your, your mental state. So that's kind of the initial, um, the initial way I found that clutter can really weigh on you. But what I also found is that when you do more decluttering and you start digging into the stories, there's so much that your clutter represents. Mm. So like, for example, um, I grew up with a family, my, my um, mother and grandparents are immigrants from China. I felt a lot of kind of pressure to have a certain kind of success, a certain mm -hmm. kind of corporate success, you know, corner office, impressive job title. And, um, but that's not what I wanted for myself. And so I was clinging to certain clothes, for example, like, you know, a certain blazer that I felt I never wore it. It didn't even mm -hmm. reflect the job that I had, but I was just clinging to it. And it was when I started to declutter, it was actually like a gift to myself. And it was me saying, it's okay. If you don't live that kind of life that you thought you have to live. And so the stuff that you own um, can kind of reflect these beliefs about who you think you should be, who you think you have to be. And so that was another layer of liberation when I decluttered, letting go of items was me sort of saying, I'm accepting myself. Mm. I don't need to have these things that I thought I had to have. Oh my goodness. I love that. I mean, I like certainly I hadn't thought of that in terms of the corporate, like getting corporate clothes and because you're feeling pressure to be in the corporate area, but I know this comes up often for listeners with like the skinny jeans or the, <laughs> the you know, where you're like, Oh, maybe someday I'll fit into that. Or that what I wore when I was 18 and now I'm 42 <laughs> and the pressure you put on yourself. If every time you open your closet, you see that, or, I also know listeners can feel pressure from like the sweater that great aunt Sally gave them because she, but they never liked and, and you're just sort of holding it there um, for these reasons. So how would you suggest people get started with something like that? Like maybe clothing items? Yeah, sure. Um, so if whenever I approach decluttering, it's kind of a two-part approach. There is a more practical approach and then there's sort of the emotional approach. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever done any decluttering, you've probably noticed that you struggle with both. So if you take, for example, those jeans that you might wear someday that you no longer fit, yeah. right? Super common. Um, there is the practical side, which is like, well, realistically, you might know that you're never going to wear them someday. They're not your style, but emotionally it's a little bit hard. Mm. Cause you know, I think yeah. we all know why it's like, just, you know, there's so many right. layers. Um, so one thing I think if we, with, with that particular example, it's probably a bit more emotional. I find that women in particular, we tend to downplay the cost of something to our well being, mm -hmm. right? So we are a lot of often people pleasers, aren't we? We will, you know, put ourselves under the pump so that our husbands or our kids don't have to suffer. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I find is that when we are decluttering something like that pair of jeans, you're thinking, well, what if I need it someday? Then I'll have to go out and buy a $15 pair of jeans. Right. Mm -hmm. But so we think of that cost well, 15, a lot more for a pair right, of jeans. Right, yeah. um, but we don't think about the cost to our well being. Mm -hmm. So what is the cost to you? How do you feel every day you look into your closet and you're surrounded by clothes you don't fit? That is cutting you down a little bit every day emotionally. And so sometimes the biggest challenge is just saying, hey, my feelings count. 
it's okay for me to do something that might not be practical. Sure, I might need those someday, but right now it doesn't matter because I want to do something for myself. I'm going to take care of myself and really approaching decluttering um, from the aspect of self-kindness, self-compassion, a gift you're giving yourself as opposed to forcing yourself to get rid of things. I so that. I have never heard people coming <laughs> with decluttering, but I can absolutely see that and just recognizing like, what is it costing us to, you know, how nice is it if every time I go into my closet, I see like five things that I can't wear or that I'm, you know, or also the people pleasing of like that great aunt Sally giving us the thing. It's like, okay, great aunt Sally can't see in her closet. And, and why are we making ourselves like, maybe she thinks about it once a year, maybe she's gone. You know, like I know people mm -hmm. have like ugly vases in their house that they're like, oh, cause my, you know, deceased relative gave it to me. It's like, well here, <laughs> how can we, what is it costing you to have it there? I love thinking of people pleasing and how it relates to clutter. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's so interesting because I find that so many, um, sometimes the way we act in our relationships is reflected in the way. <clears throat> so <sorry>. oh. <clears throat> oh gosh, okay. Um, but sometimes the way that we act in our relationships is reflected in the way that we act with our stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So another example, um, I've worked with some of my clients. Some of us, again, a very common trait with women, we want to be the one who's always prepared anybody needs something, they come to us, right? Mm. So mom, I can't find this, or, you know, you're just, you're the one who's always there for everyone. So sometimes that fear of decluttering things that you might not use is because you don't want to be that, um, have to let someone down when they come to you and say, oh, do you have that thing? Can I borrow it? And you're like, no, actually I got rid of it. And so it's less about um, the actual item. It's about your identity and mm. how you feel that maybe you want, maybe it's sometimes even as much as, you know, maybe people won't love me if I'm not the one who can always give them everything they need. Love and me so, or maybe they'll be disappointed. Like I know that's something that a lot of my listeners like struggle with. If, if someone else in their life having emotions, you know, and, and getting sort of attached to those emotions. Like if someone's like, where's my cheerleading uniform from high school? Cause I want to dress up as Halloween, you know, and this is like your 30 year old yeah. kid who's moved out of their house. It, it's just that like, yeah, you, you know, they, they chose to not take it with them. Let's, let's set yourself free too. But that, that's really helpful to look at that, you know, where codependency might even be coming into our, mm. to our clutter. Um, and just this, just the weight, like where you're talking about, I was going to say the weight of having things around and talking about how they're all sort of these these decisions, these unfinished decisions I hadn't, I hadn't thought about, but I know that on decisions, unfinished decisions in our brain lead us to feel that mental load and the clutter in our head, that stress. Um, yeah, very interesting. And I, I guess, how do you work with women to feel more confident about that? Because some of, I mean, I'm, I'm reading between the lines, but I imagine that some of making these decisions is then having your back when you have the decision, you know, deciding like, I'm going to clear out the old Halloween costumes. And it is possible that my 30 year old is going to come to me and ask yep. for it. And I'm okay. You know, sort of that, like women taking agency and confidence for their decisions. Is that Yeah, on? definitely. That's a great question. So first of all, I think that sometimes just bringing the awareness mm. is very big mm. because it is, the thing with clutter, which can be so challenging, is that each individual item seems so insignificant. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I'll just inconvenience myself this tiny bit, right? It's just one cheerleading uniform. I just have to keep that, you know, what's the big deal? But then the magnitude of it, when you have hundreds, if not thousands of items in your home, the weight of that is a lot. And so sometimes just realizing, you know, just like the conversation we're having, like, oh, actually, that is hurting me. Right. And so sometimes that awareness is enough. But the other thing is, I always teach that the first step with decluttering is clarity. And by clarity, I really um, encourage people to step back, even from actually thinking about their house and their stuff and just thinking about their values and priorities. Right. So if you sat and you thought about your values and priorities separate, you'd probably say, well, I really care about my kids. It's also important for me to take care of myself. These are the things I care about. And when you lay that all out, um, ideally even write it down. Mm -hmm. And then when you get overwhelmed by the emotion of your stuff, you can reflect back and say, okay, I care about this, but I also care about this. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it just gives you a little bit of perspective. I think that the key to decluttering is just experimenting with different perspective shifts mm -hmm. and finding one that resonates with you so that it becomes empowering to declutter as opposed to restrictive. I kind of always use the example of dieting. If you're on a diet and you're being forced to not eat things, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't usually work long term. You know, it's quite a negative experience. Whereas if you come from a place of, I am choosing this to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing like a healthier lifestyle. It's more sustainable. It feels good. No one's telling you what to do. I try to take the same approach to decluttering. Yeah. The other thing I think is really important. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, keep going. I love it. Um. So the other thing I think <laughs> We've got the delay. Um, but the other thing I think is really important um, is that when we think about just in case items, right? I'm keeping this just in case so and so needs this someday. One of my big tips that I always offer is if you ask that question, your mind is going to look for problems because you've asked your brain to say, tell me all the ways it'll be a problem if I don't have this. So if you change the question just a bit, what if I need this someday and I don't have it? What will we do instead? Mm, now your brain yeah. is going to be looking for solutions. So the same thing, right? Your daughter's going to come for that cheerleading uniform and she doesn't have it. What is she going to do instead? Now your brain's going to be like, well, she has a million other options. It's not going to be that big of a deal. She can just find something else. And it's very freeing, isn't it? Because you're like, oh, it's not a big deal. But we just tend to stop when we ask the wrong questions. I love it. It gets you into problem solving mode. You're like, all right, well, what will we do? Or what will we, like even the kitchen platter, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm choosing to get rid of it because it will feel better to have empty space there. Because one of my values is, you know, cleanliness and, and ease. And then what, you know, what happens when we need that, when we throw the dinner party, it's like, well, what will we do instead? All right, well, probably the food that's catered will be on a platter or we'll put it on a lot of different colored plates or it just gets you into that more creative open mindset of problem solving. I love that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm like, I'm in because I, 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 and I also hadn't heard of this, you know, stopping to think with clarity and value work around um, decluttering. So what would some examples of, of sort of like perspective change, like what do you see some people choosing as a value or like a perspective to, to start decluttering? Yeah, so that's a really good question because I really, for me, um, decluttering is values work. It's mm -hmm. intentional living uh -huh. and it's just you choosing it with your stuff. Um, and the powerful thing is the more you practice it with your stuff, the more you can start to apply it to the bigger picture of your life. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, just thinking of some decluttering I did recently with my kids, right, toys. <laughs> yeah. um, we live in a very small, very small house, a very small two bedroom apartment. I've got two young children. Um, and so a boundary that I have for myself is that I don't like to keep more toys in our living area that can easily be cleaned up in about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Because for me, it's not the physical space time. If I think about my values, right? It's about time I'm spending with a, mm -hmm. with my kids and time that I have for myself in the evening. That's kind of where I'm aligning it, right? So a lot of people, when you're decluttering, you're just thinking, well, can I fit it in? Do I have enough space? But sometimes you're shifting it to that time and framing it into the, the impact of the clutter, mm. right? So um, when I am decluttering, and I use this language when I talk to my children, I don't say, this is rubbish, we should get rid of it, or you're not using this. I don't use that. I say to my kids, I say things, is it getting hard to clean up? Are we spending too much time? Because that's appealing to their values and their priorities, right? That's what my kids care about. They don't want to spend so much time cleaning up. So mm -hmm. I say, should we make it easier to clean up? And that's the same kind of way, even though it's sometimes easier to see it with kids, but the same way should we be asking ourselves, should I make this easier for myself? Because yeah. this is aligned with my values. And then when I um, actually going through the decluttering, what I encourage people to think of, I've got a toy in my hand right now, right? With this toy, you're sort of looking at it and you're going, is having this, the extra time I'm spending cleaning this, is that worth it to me? Is that trade-off worth it to me? Mm -hmm. It's really important to name the trade-offs. What is this costing me? Mm -hmm. And is it worth it? And it might seem kind of silly when you're looking at like a spoon in your kitchen or whatever, but that's why we start with that clarity, that bigger vision. You remember, is this helping me live that kind of life that I want? 
or not? Is it taking me closer or not? Because I am quite, um, I think um, maybe in some people's opinions, quite a relaxed minimalist. I don't have very strict rules. I don't say like, you know, you can only keep 30 books or anything like that. I think it's very personal and you mm -hmm. have to decide what is enough for you. But sometimes it's just asking that question. When you think about your values and priorities, when you think about your resources in terms of time, energy, money, space, how do you want to allocate them? Mm. And then working backwards from there. Mm. Um, and again, I fi personally find that very empowering. It's just a different mindset. So um, I'm not choosing to get rid of something, right? Mm. Because that feels crappy. Nobody wants to think <laughs> about getting, I am choosing to create this life that I want. Mm. And then you're like, yeah, I'm choosing to have good, more time. I'm it? choosing to have less stress. Or I'm yeah, I really, I really like that. And I, I remember um, when a while ago I started to see, like I heard someone like you saying, you know, the more you have, the more you need to organize and the more you need to clean and the more you need to dust and the more you need to you know, all of that. And, and that speaks to your point of like maybe one little toy or one little knickknack doesn't, you know, it's, it's sort of that like, oh, what's the point? But we can get into big drama in our heads of these, like what the points, you know, what's the point add up. Um, also with with listeners, we know that those what's the point or like, what does it matter? Those add up in our other relationships too. Like, what does it matter if she's always late to lunch or what does it matter if he, you know, never gives me a hug at the end of the day? Like those things add up to build big time <laughs> drama in our yeah. relationships. So seeing that in decluttering and organizing too, I you reminded me of something when you just you just were speaking of of getting clear with your intention and your clarity and what you want one of the greatest things i did because i moved from america here and we only took five suitcases and it was like oh my goodness what do we take someone had told me they're like choose how many of x you want like so say how many pairs of socks that i want so seven pairs of socks versus going through my sock drawer and like picking out what I didn't, have you heard of this? <laughs> Could you speak to why that Absolutely. was better? <laughs> Absolutely. I actually call this, so if you start with this idea of clarity, mm -hmm. you're, you're beginning, um, so I think it's Stephen Covey's quote, you begin with the end in mind, right? Mm -hmm. What is the life that you want? Don't think about the specifics. And then say, if I was starting fresh, if I was building my dream life right now, how many pairs of socks would I need? Mm -hmm. How much space in my home what I want to allocate to um, my collection, right? It's not saying you don't have to have a collection, just saying if you were starting from an ideal situation and you start to build these boundaries, okay? So you might think if I'm not, because it's if you start by thinking I have 20 items, then everything's a painful decision, right? But instead of just saying I'm building my dream wardrobe, in my dream wardrobe, I have five fabulous dresses that I mix and match. Then we're gonna create that. We're gonna make that your reality. Um, and these boundaries are also very helpful because they reduce decision fatigue. Yeah. So the other thing I recommend is exactly what you said. That's really excellent spot on advice. But I even recommend you can take it a bit further. Socks, for example. What are your favorite pair of socks? What do you know about your favorite pair of socks? Is it the cover, uh, color? Are they cotton? Whatever, anything. And then you can say, I'm going to keep five pairs of socks and only cotton socks. Mm. Or I'm going to keep five dresses but I know that I feel my best this is a personal example I love the look of long dresses yeah. but I love short dresses that's just me I feel my best in them so I'm just going to say I'm not going to wear long dresses anymore mm -hmm. and what's fantastic is you create those boundaries for yourself you don't have to have someone else tell you you decide yourself your boundaries and it just again closes down that mental load if I walk into a shop now I don't even look at long dresses mm. I like them I admire them on other women I think they're beautiful, but they're not what I enjoy wearing the most. And it's again that sort of simplifying. There's just so much less to think about. I mean, yeah. And then in the, and then you have so much lead. This is where it helps warriors. Like when you go in to get dressed and you go to the closet and there are only five dresses there, it really simplifies everything out. And in our brain, when we're like, but what if I don't have the perfect dress for the garden? party then we know we use Jennifer's question of like well what would I do instead not not this like drama it's like okay maybe choose a short dress or you just like it, I really I really appreciate that and also this idea of thinking of your ideal life like you know 
sort of like how many pairs of socks do I want, but also how many drawers of utensils do I want? Or what do I want my medicine cabinet to look like? And and working from that instead of this like almost disciplinarian, like, oh, Susie, you're bad. Look at your current drawers of utensils. It's It helps clarify things. Yeah. And what you just said there is really important because I have found, again, with um, women in particular, one of the biggest obstacles mm -hmm. to decluttering is shame and kind of the moral judgment where people think clutter is negative. You know, you just said it all oh, look, I'm a bad person. I have too much clutter. I have too many drawers. Right. And if you find that to be painful, if you feel ashamed of yourself because mm -hmm. your house doesn't look like what you think it is supposed to, it's hard to declutter because every time you show up, you've got to sit there with those feelings that say, Hey, how did you let it get to this? Right. That was something I dealt with all the time. Jen, how did you let it get to this place? You know, you should have had better self-control. You should have been better with your money. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having those kind of thoughts, those really um, almost mean thoughts to yourself, right. it's hard It's hard to show up because every time you show up, you know, you're reminded of that. So I think that's why sometimes we tend to put things in the back of our closet and just shove them back there not to deal with because we don't want to deal with those really hard feelings. Whereas if we approach, um, if we approach the cluttering with self-kindness and compassion, again, you can say, hey, um, I mean, I bought, for, this is something personal. I did a lot of shopping because I was going through hard periods in my life. I didn't have support. I didn't have skills to deal with it. So those things that I have, they're not proof that I was a bad person or that I was, you know, lacking control. It's just proof that I'm human and didn't have the support that I need. And when I approach it again from that, I start to be like, well, I can be kind to myself and say, I did that. I, you know, forgive myself or I'm not angry with myself and I can let go now from a different place. And I find that really helpful. Oh, that's so needed. That's so, because exactly as you said, like shame over clutter, but also I know it comes up with shame for people over like maybe items that still have clothing items that still have the tag on them because, you know, maybe they bought the wrong long dress because they thought they'd wear it or they shame mm -hmm. even that they only wore it once or five times or, um, and shame that they don't like the vase from Uncle Charlie. <laughs> all, all of that. Yeah. Okay. So you just encourage people to sort of be aware of that shame, first of all, that they're, that they're having that mindset. Yeah. So it's actually, um, the way that I teach it is actually a three-part process. We've kind of touched on them all, but it's a cycle. So it starts with creating clarity, clarity about your, what, what you want, but also clarity about the challenges trying to figure out what do you, what's your unique relationship with clutter, because it's different for everyone, you know, depending on your childhood or your lived experiences. So we start to create some of that clarity. Then we take intentional action, which is creating some of those boundaries or thinking about the trade-offs. We're decluttering, not just randomly picking things up, but we're thinking about um, what we want out of life, right? And then it's the compassionate curiosity. When decluttering is hard, now we've got to offer ourselves some self-compassion. And so we start thinking about, okay, well, why is this hard for me? Maybe I need some time to create some closure. I mean, this is why the mental clutter, and this is why also, as you just say, I often talk about decluttering being this big life-changing thing. And it's because it's more than the stuff in your home, right? So maybe you have to declutter your, you want to declutter your grandma's sweater, but you have some guilt because when she was alive, you didn't spend enough time with your grandmother. So maybe it's a slow process, but maybe you have to spend a little time. Maybe you write a letter to your grandmother. Maybe you just practice some affirmations that you forgive yourself, right? It's, it's a very personal journey. And then when you declutter that sweater, you're also decluttering some of that guilt that you've been carrying. And yeah. that is the life-changing effect um, of decluttering. It's not the sweater itself. Mm -hmm. It's everything that's represented. And then it's a cycle, right? Now you have a little bit more compassion. You did that. You, you have that closure. You came out. Okay. Mm -hmm. You realize that everything you thought was going to scare you. Okay, right. Now you've got a bit more strength and you go through the cycle again. You have a bit more clarity. You can take more action. And it's sort of this, this cycle that we sort of go through. Um, and eventually the more that you practice it, my experience was it started with me, with my stuff, but it was almost like a muscle that I exercised. Yeah. I started to become more intentional with my spending, with my um, schedule, you know, creating boundaries, right? It was just, it's just a practice. And I think it's something that we 
all do all the time in our lives. It's not something that I have invented. It's just bringing awareness to the process and sort of saying, well, this is what I'm doing. Mm. And when you have that awareness, it builds a skill, I think. Yeah, I I've, I will echo that I have felt that too, that it is like a muscle that I'm building in it and it has momentum. Um, back to what you were saying at the beginning, like once you start seeing it in a different way, like, you know, once you start thinking of something in a different way, the things you think of change, or you, and, and it is this, like once I started to see like how the extra clutter in my house or the extra appliances on my counter or the extra drawers of utensils added mental stress to me, then when I was in Target or the store or, and like something pulled my attention or I had the urge to buy something, I, I was more aware and able to be like, yeah, where are you going to put that? And is that so great to have three spatulas when you only need two or one or um, that it, it, it helped me, you know, and that's, that's what all the thought work is about this, this awareness of what we're thinking and before sort of pausing to slow down before we're in that reactive place. I really appreciate that. Yeah, would you write on with what you were saying there that actually one of my tips as a reformed shopaholic is now <laughs> before I buy anything, I just take pause for a moment, ask myself, what am I trading? What are the trade offs? And are they worth it? Because it doesn't mean I don't ever buy things. Right. I buy clothes, you know, I'm, a, I'm still a functioning human being, but I just ask myself, it, am I willing to trade this away? You know, I like right now that, for example, I walk into my closet, it's very small, it's easy to find everything. I get dressed in five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I buy this and that's gonna make that more complicated, do I love this dress enough that I wanna give up that feeling? And sometimes I do, right? Mm -hmm. And then I know that I really want it. But just that moment of self-awareness, that pause may make you realize, actually, I don't like this that much. Mm -hmm. I was just sort of attracted to the sale price or, you know, and just those little pauses, I think, are really powerful. Yeah, I am definitely and, and that like, what are the trade offs so it, it brings you right back to the values and the clarity again, like what are the trade offs of buying this little trinket toy for the kids? Well, it's going to take me more than 10 minutes to clean up or what are the trink, you know, payoffs for buying this new dress, I'm going to have another option in my closet, I, I really um, I pre or I'll have less money in my bank account, or I'll have, you know, all all of those super helpful. And I, I think what I just want to bring listeners attention to is you're addressing it on sort of two fronts, the, the incoming and the outgoing, <laughs> because it is both like, you know, we sort of want to clear our house of the extraneous and the things that are creating the load, and then also be aware and mindful and intentional about what comes in. Um, could you speak a bit or give some pointers for listeners who are having a hard time letting go of the of the thing like say the the shirt that they never wore like yeah I think that um one thing that really helped me is realizing that there are no right or wrong answers mm -hmm. so for example I'm sure you've probably experienced the saying you know when we grow up in school we're coming up through the school system we are taught that if you try hard enough you study you know you're a good a good student a good girl you will get the right answer and if you get the wrong answer, you are bad, right? Oh. That was bad. That was naughty, right? And so as adults, I think what happens when we're decluttering is sometimes it's we wait so long to make the decision because we think we're going to have this light bulb moment where we have this spark and we know with 100% confidence that we're going to make the right decision. And so we just keep waiting. We're putting things off, waiting for that spark. And a perspective that I would like to offer is that there is no right or wrong answer, right? Uh, which, which sounds a little bit silly, but it's also very freeing because mm -hmm. now you've got some choices, okay? So you can keep your item and you know with 100% confidence that what's always happened is going to happen. Mm. Or you can get rid of it and you might need it someday, but you can create that self-trust that you're going to deal with that situation, mm. right? That's why I actually believe that self-trust and doing work on self-trust is also a huge part of decluttering because sometimes that's just it we're just i think it's perfectionism you know we're just raised to know that mistakes are so bad and it's mm -hmm. freeing to say you might make a mistake there's no one can tell you what you might need someday but it's creating that that confidence right empower and this is where again i like to always be decluttering from an empowering place i believe in myself that if i get rid of that sweater one day and i need it 
I will, I will deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right. I can do that. And then the more that you again, practice that by doing it, try it with one item, I guess on a very practical level, something else that I always recommend is if you are really struggling to declutter, if you've done it before and you just find yourself getting stuck, focus on decluttering one hard thing at a time Mm -hmm. so that you're building that muscle go all the way to the end. You know, you've got one thing that you're really struggling, do the whole experience, even if it takes you a month to make the decision, go for it, let it go. And then be, then live with the consequences and you'll be stronger next time. As opposed to, you know, a lot of traditional decluttering advice is like dump everything out, get this whole room done in one day. Right. That's overwhelming, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So you're saying like, if they're really struggling with that sweater from Aunt Sally, like just work on the sweater from Aunt Sally and, and get rid of it, give it to, you know, Goodwill or whatever, and then sit with your thoughts about it and strengthen your muscle, like work through the shame, work through the discomfort. Yeah. I I really, I appreciate that. And I I, I guess I also want to say or reflect what I think I'm hearing from you is that there might be consequences. And that's been my experience with bringing over five suitcases. And that was five suitcases between my husband and I. (laughs) So it's not just five suitcases of all my stuff of living for 50 years in the States. It was five suitcases that I have had that very real experience where it's like, okay, I left that green sweater at home. And then I've been here looking for it. And I'm like, all right. And, you know, I can tell you the consequences is I feel a negative emotion, but I don't perish. I don't, you know, I just feel like a, a tightness in my chest that feels like disappointment and like, oh, bummer. All right. Yeah. Now what? I'll wear the sweater. <laughs> it's like that. And if like, you think about the trade-offs. <laughs> yeah. Because if you didn't bring that, mm-hmm. if you brought everything, what would it cost you? Right? Maybe you wouldn't have been able to come. Maybe you would have spent tens of thousands of dollars shipping everything over. Right? And so, yes, you have to deal with that negative emotion. But the other consequence is maybe you never know what's possible, Mm -hmm. right? So like something, um, again, speaking to the big picture of decluttering, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes you're just getting rid of a few items, right? But if you do that consistently, you're going to reclaim your time, your space, your energy. What might happen with that? You don't know. Maybe you might write a book that you have always dreamed of doing. Maybe you're going to start taking a painting class that you've always dreamed of doing, which might grow into something bigger and more beautiful. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Here's another question, a reframe I always ask people. If, um, and it depends obviously on the things that you enjoy, but I say, let's say tomorrow you won a contest and you get to go on a six month dream holiday anywhere you want to go. What would be holding you back? right? And obviously, it's just a mind exercise. We have responsibilities and things. But um, I just sort of think, you know, would it be like, oh, I couldn't because I've got, you know, to pack the whole house away and just finding reframes that align with, you know, something that interests you. If some amazing opportunity, let's say you're interested in craft and you were gotten this um, opportunity to get a mentorship from someone you admire, could you do it? Or is your life so full right now that there's no space for something magical to happen? Mm. Yeah, I really like that. And I I, am reminded of that. Like, I think Oprah says, like, you need to, you need to give from sort of the overflow of your cup, or she says, like, you need to empty your cup so you can fill it. Like, we have to have empty space so that we can fill it and then being intentional with filling it. And I frankly, I find great freedom in not filling it. (laughs) Like having, having the buffer, having the edge there of, Um, And I I guess that's what I, you know, as we come to the end here, I just want to offer to listeners and viewers that, that on the other side of some of these uncomfortable decisions and uncomfortable, you know, getting rid of Aunt Sally's sweater or deciding what, you know, to do with that vase is a feeling of, of lightness and freedom and, and openness um, that, that I, I, that I now know because I have gone through the decluttering. I had lots of stuff where I was whole, you know, even, even back further from when I moved, when I went through my divorce, just the way that my divorce played out is I had to leave my house. I had one hour to leave the house where I raised my three kids in and I couldn't take anything with me that Mm -hmm. wasn't mine. So I had to leave behind all the paintings by the kids, all the Christmas albums, all the, my, my wedding dress, like all, (laughs) all of it. And that felt very heavy to me at the time. And on the other side of that, while I do miss, especially when I'm 
videoing one of my kids and they're at their dad's house and I see the painting behind them that I got framed that they did with their fingerprints. I'm like, ah, I have a negative emotion. <laughs> but in, in reality, on the other side of it, I'm freaking fine. Like I am fine. I might have moments of like longing or sorrow that I don't have that, but ultimately it's way more open and I get to live the life I design lined up with my values and clarity. So I really appreciate you bringing this to us. If listeners want to learn more and work with you and, and get into this, I mean, you have a very empowering way to view decluttering and, and um, like I'm energized. Where should I direct them? Um, I would probably say if you go to simplyfiercely.com slash free guide, okay. that will give you a place where you can sign up for my free decluttering guide. And it also gets you on my newsletter where I share lots of the kind of tips that we've been talking about um, in this interview. And that's probably the best way to connect with me. Um, and then I send out tons of free resources. I also have a podcast, The Simply and Fiercely Show. Okay, I'm going to put that all in the show notes just to clarify it and declutter it for listeners. So smbwell.com slash 272. Um, and I and your Instagram too is great. So I will put all of that great. in there. Um, and listeners can find you. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.